Well, welcome to the set. My name is John Knowles here with Mrs. Margaret Tusa. Why are we here? I think we're here for two reasons. If you believe in St. Teresa, if you believe, first of all, in God, um, it's time to give, to support God's accompanying work in the parish and in our community and our world. And if you don't know us, and if you don't know God, here's someone whose life of faith has been lived in an extraordinary way. Someone you just might want to get to know. Here's a little bit about Mrs. Tusa before we get into the interview. Uh, she's been a religious sister, Catholic school girl, a wife, a mother, principal, a teacher. Um, she has four children, of whom three are living. And she has, uh, how many years have you been in this parish? It seems 40 or 50 years. <laughs> yes, and that's that's only a portion of your, your life of faith. So this is a this is a real privilege for me and for us to be here with you. Uh, this is August 2020, uh, and I'm sure that uh, many things are kind of swirling in your mind and your life right now. Um, I've been privileged to be a, a part of some of them. Can you tell me what's been going on? Well, I'm just pleased to be able to say yes to this and uh, examine and also reflect what I've done to contribute to the parish. It makes me think back of all the different things. Just seeing the um, environment has totally changed, yet the spirit is there. The spirit from past pastors, even Father Randall and Father um, Smystrilla, well before Father Nestia or Father Phil was on the scene. They, they were all trying to unify and find ways to get parishioners involved, which basically ended up being the, the big fundraiser, um, the big parish fundraiser. Uh, I forgot when it, it was in October. Yeah, the October Bazaar. Yes. I've, I've read about that in the archives. The two, okay, two memories days. from the Ar October Bazaar. Let's go. Yes. Oh, memories? Well, it, it's more like a doing thing. My husband and I were, were chairmen, so we would keep things going and just change the whole environment right here at the parish with cars and trucks and tents, and it was just just very, just very great. And parishioners would um, man the booths or the food, and oh, there were great dinners. It was, it was something that was celebrated throughout the city of Houston to go to St. Teresa uh, annual bazaar. Um, and what was next? Then we began uh, considering building a community center. And that's what evolved in the, uh, the gym now. Uh, the, we were all excited about something new being planned, and, and it was. Um, but we thought it was going to be used mainly for one venture until the parish has begun, has uh, evolved into multi parishioners. I mean, people outside have chosen to come here because they want to be here. And uh, that really opened our doors and also added to our numbers. Yeah, so these were evangelical events, like these were a play. These were places where the community got to be a community living the gospel and inviting others to share in that. Yes, and be part of it. Yeah, how did you become a part of, I mean, because, so you arrive on the scene. We can talk about your, uh, your antecedents and how you arrived in the Heights and at the parish. Uh, but uh, first of all, I mean, let's, let's just assume, okay, so you get here. Yes. How do you become involved? Well, that was always the struggle from every one of the pastors that I've been with. Um, you, first, you have your, um, your invitations to a meeting, and that began with greeters. Father Smyshula started involving uh, parishioners to greet you at the door, and that's where the greeters began. And one of the greeters that's still here is Deacon Dwight Cole and his wife, Anne. They were the first ones to come up to Joe and I one Sunday. They were new to the parish. They joined, 
and here is Dwight and Anne serving us totally. Um, other involvements were the um, homebound, bringing communion to the sick. Joe and I figured we could, we could uh, join that apostolate, and uh, we did that for many, many years. And it brings you closer to your own spirituality because it's always a reminder of where you will be at some time in your life. So each one of those two things, the um, giving of your time and being available to greet people, those were great introductions to being active here at St. Teresa. So the pastor called and you answered. Yes, yes. he did, just like you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was over at dinner to Father Phil's house, and he didn't ask me this directly at, at that time, but the question to me ended up being, do you want to come work here? We need someone to work in the liturgy. And so I did. So this is just uh, kind of how interpersonal connections build a chance to get involved and to serve. Yeah, that's so I'm, beautiful. I've been, a beautiful way to say it, John. Yeah. And I, you know, the part of the reason we're on camera, maybe the entire reason we're on camera now is COVID-19. You know, we, yes. we can't be as perhaps interpersonal and as physically present to each other as we want to be. Right. Um, that's, that's really saddened my heart and negatively affected my life. Um, yeah. I mean, it, so I know you're on, on camera right now and it might add a little pressure, but you know, how do we navigate this? How do we, as a parish, how do we ensure that those who want to be involved with us and who may not physically see the pastor? I mean, do you have any ideas? Have you given this any thought? We're limited just as we thought we were really limited in my early days when there were no other buildings or no, uh, not a staff that would handle things. You would do it yourself. You would move tables and you would move, you would bring your truck and you would just do the hauling or whatever it took. Now, at least in that aspect of physical positioning, um, the parish does it for you or he hire, they hire someone to do that. And you are free to um, make your choice to join something or be involved in the uh, this taping procedure through tapes to uh, see what's going on at Mass. That's about all we can do at this time. And it's, um, it's not as encompassing as you would like it to be, but uh, that's where we are today. We're back in the catacombs, almost. Yeah, that's a, uh, that, I mean, I don't want to make this like a, but it, it is true right, that we are kind of hunkering down yeah, and we buried. are, <laughs> yeah. But then too, like, I think there's a great reason for, for hope here is that people can start to miss their parish and start to take that sense of ownership that you mentioned. Like this is our yes. parish. This is not somewhere that um, we may or may not give and then people serve me. But it's where uh, I give my heart uh, and of my time and of what money I'm able to give so that, that both my friends and neighbors who know the gospel and those who don't start to benefit through things like the bazaar, things like that. Yes. Okay. Well, um, then let's go into your background. I mean, we can't take for granted that you know, you're going to be sitting here, a, a daily communicant, somebody who's uh, lived her, her many years of life in this you know, close communion with God. I mean, that had to start somewhere, right? It um, did. Where did it, it start? Catholic school. My, my parents made sure that uh, we attended uh, Holy Name. We lived on the north side of Houston, and that's where we, we began. And I received all my sacraments through the Incarnate Word Sisters. Therefore, I was inclined to join their order, and I did. And I was uh, a professed nun for 25 years. No, just under 25. It would have been my silver jubilee. Um, I was there 23 years and enjoyed every minute of it in my association with incarnate word nuns. 
they're not as prevalent now because of their diminishing aging numbers. But um, they inspired me from the very beginning. And um, I wanted to be a teacher. Therefore, I wanted to join that order. And uh, from there, my education began to just flower into um, University of St. Thomas, a degree and um, a master's degree, and then uh, later, um, uh, hours for um, principalship. So therefore, I was educated and trained to go into um, administration. And uh, that was also used here at St. Teresa. I was hitting up some of the committees that we needed at the time. Um, anything that had to do with art or I would help the sacristan. That was, uh, that was really my forte. Yeah, so it's a rare breed that can teach and have that charisma in the classroom but then also get behind a desk, knowing what the teachers are going through day to day and help out that process as an administrator. So yeah. um, my, my congratulations. I mean, that's, that's both difficult, but very rewarding work. It, it is. I mean, if you are a, if you're a good teacher, you want to uh, bring out something in your student or whoever is attending your session. You want to make them so excited, they don't want to miss it. They don't want to go out and take a break. They don't want to leave you. They they just, and that's the way I felt in my classroom, too, every classroom. Just make it so exciting or interesting that they will stay. Yeah, I, I remember uh, someone telling me a story about Mr. Neville, who was my principal at Strake Jesuit. And he had died by that point, but somebody recalled, um, it was one of my fellow teachers when I came back to teach there, she said he observed her class and, she said, and he said, you're giving the students a gift. Uh, you're giving the students a gift. And so then the, the kind of takeaway from that was you need to kind of have an effective lesson wrap up, like a kind of yes. bell thing, um, like right at the bell. But uh, but no, I think the, the overarching message was that you're right. You know, you are kind of throwing your heart and soul and most of your time into ensuring that these kids kind of stay with you and receive what you have to give. Yes. More, more than that, it's not what you say, it's what you do, how you look, how you treat them, uh, your whole being, not just sort of a script kind of thing. It was... Uh, they would want to be a teacher if you were the, if you were a good example to them. Yeah, back to the sisters. What was, what was inspiring about their example and their teaching? But one in particular. A one in particular? Or well, what in particular? I mean, you can certainly. I mean, examples are helpful here, but. Well, Sister Regina is now dead, but she was my model. She was the principal of the school when I was in school, and I just thought she was great. She was tough. Sometimes mean, but uh, I think everyone has some kind of experience with a nun, and they have very negative feelings. But it didn't matter. Sister Regina was my model, and uh, she was so glad to see me enter as a postulant and uh, be a novice. And her training paid off. Yeah. And I, maybe this is an irreverent speculation, but maybe you enter just to see her soft side. <laughs> well, <laughs> could that's be. a good, good way of putting it. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, because I actually have kind of experienced that, that too, where like toward the end of my time with this Jesuit at Boston College, um, he, he really opened up. He's like, man, I'm proud of you. You know, like, I, but he, but he was someone who I and other people were like terrified of at the beginning. <laughs> No, but isn't that strange? When you really get to know someone, you really have a, your heart just beats with them. Okay. Let's talk about 
romance after the oh, romance. convent oh. <laughs> after the convent after the comes uh Joe Tusa yeah okay Joe and and what was, what may, I, it? may I tell that story sure I mean it's uh <laughs> you can cut it out if you wish Like, subscribe, or comment below.